So um, carbohydrates, the name tells us a little bit about the chemical elements. So if you see carbo here, so carbo tells us there's going to be hydrogen. Oh my gosh, it's too early in the morning. Excuse me, back up. <laughs> carbo tells us that we're going to have carbon present. The hydrate refers to water. Okay, so we know that water is H2O, so carbohydrates will have carbon and then hydrogen and oxygen. Carbohydrates are used um, in cell structures. They're used as energy sources. And as we said here, they consist of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The simplest, oh my gosh, just, uh, excuse us, our big dog just came in here, so we're gonna try to move good old brew out. <laughs> it's kind of, a, kind of a farm here with animals coming and going. Okay, sorry for the distraction. So the simplest carbohydrates are monosaccharides. Um, we could use this formula for every carbon, there'll be the elements of water. So we're going to see a lot of um, oxygen. So we know that the carbohydrates are going to be uh, really hydrophilic. So we'll have carbonyl groups. And remember, that's a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. We'll have hydroxyl groups. So that's an oxygen linked to a hydrogen. So they're very polar they're, and they're hydrophilic. And then we'll talk about three basic classes. The monosaccharides, and mono means one sugar. So for as an example, glucose um, is a monosaccharide, probably the most famous one, ribose, deoxyribose are monosaccharides. Then we'll talk a little bit about disaccharides, how we can take two monosaccharides and link them together, forming a new, um, what's called a glycosidic bond through dehydration synthesis. And we'll talk about lactose and sucrose. So lactose is milk sugar and sucrose is good old table sugar. And then we'll talk about polysaccharides, which is many sugar subunits, many monosaccharide subunits linked together, forming long chains. And we'll, there's many different polysaccharides, but we'll, we'll talk about a few that are made out of glucose. So we'll talk about um, cellulose and uh, glycogen and uh, plant starch, amylose and amylopectin. So we'll start with the simplest of the carbohydrates, the monosaccharides, sometimes referred to as simple sugars. And monosaccharides can have um, between three and seven carbon atoms. We'll use glucose as probably the most famous monosaccharide. Okay, so um, carbon has six carbons, so it's called a hexose, hex for six. And the ending OSE is, tells us it's a carbohydrate. And it's really cool because in a uh, water-rich environment of the cell, glucose can flicker back and forth between a linear form and then these two ring structures. So in the linear form, this would be carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And again, we see um, this carbonyl group, terminal carbonyl and aldehyde. This is a polar covalent bond. And then if we look at all these hydroxyl groups, they're also going to have polar covalent bonds. So we can see that glucose will be very hydrophilic. Water loves it. And in, um, indeed, within the water, water rich um, interior of the cell, as we mentioned, the glucose is fl flickering back and forth between linear and ring and linear and ring. It probably spends most of the time in, it, in the linear forms, the ring forms here. And we can see there's two different configurations of glucose in the ring form and one of them is called alpha glucose and here we want to focus on the orientation of the hydroxyl group this is carbon one in the ring structure and you'll see in the alpha glucose the hydroxyl group is pointing downward below the plane of the of the ring structure here so this is alpha glucose and then the opposite orientation of the hydroxyl on carbon one, where it's sticking up above the, the plane of our ring structure is called beta glucose. And again, you might say, well, why is that important? Well, when we're making polysaccharides from glucose, the structure will be determined based on whether we're going to use the alpha glucose or the beta glucose. So um, again, when we come to the polysaccharides, we'll see that cellulose is made from beta the beta glucose and starch, amylose, amylopectin, and glycogen are polysaccharides made of the alpha glucose configuration. And again, the glucose can be used as an energy source and also 
um, used as a structural component. Just as we saw with um, two amino acids being linked together in dehydration synthesis, which eventually will help build our proteins, just as we saw two nucleotides will be linked together in dehydration synthesis, forming that phosphodiester bond and eventually the long polymer of nucleotides we call nucleic acids, two monosaccharides can be joined together by dehydration synthesis. So here we have um, our reactants here. So here we have two hexoses, two six-carbon sugars, glucose and fructose. They're structural isomers. They have the same um, atoms and number of atoms, but the orientation is different. So here we'll see enzymes will catalyze removal of the elements of water. So here's our hydrogen, hydrogen, oxygen will be removed. We'll have an electron rearrangement. And the result will be that the two residues of our two monosaccharides will be joined together now by this new covalent bond called a glycosidic bond. So that will be important to remember for our exam. So the, um, one of our end products here is called a disaccharide, and specifically this disaccharide is called sucrose. And we know this is table sugar. It's sweet. And then the other end product, of course, is water. Now, just as we saw with other dehydration synthesis, we can, we can um, force these reactions to run backwards. That is, we can take our sucrose, reintroduce the elements of water, rearrange the electrons, breaking the glycosidic bond, and then we end up with our original glucose and fructose. So that's considered hydrolysis as part of the digestive process. We'll next move on to disaccharides. The only two disaccharides you need to know for the lecture exam, one will be lactose, milk sugar found in the milk of mammals. Mammals make milk to feed their babies. So lactose is a disaccharide found in milk, and the two monosaccharides that make up lactose are glucose and galactose. And then the second disaccharide you want to know is the one we've already mentioned, sucrose, table sugar, and sucrose is made up of glucose and fructose monosaccharides. So here's the dehydration synthesis again showing formation of sucrose. And here we have hydrolysis of sucrose running the opposite way. So we are interested in hydrolytic enzymes, digest digestive enzymes, especially when we're talking about our microbes. We want to, you know, we always want to ask ourselves, well, can a microbe use lactose as a carbon and energy source? Could a microbe use sucrose as a carbon and energy source? And to do that, the microbes or, or other organisms have to have the um, hydrolytic enzymes, digestive enzymes, to hydrolyze that glycosidic bond between the two monosaccharides. So if we're talking about lactose, milk sugar, okay, um, mammals such as ourselves, we make the enzyme called lactase to hydrolyze that glycosidic bond. Now in bacteria, bacteria have the equivalent of lactase, but it has a fancier name and it's a mouthful. Bacterial lactase is called beta-galactosidase. And again, it's gonna hydrolyze that glycosidic bond between glucose and galactose. And then the glucose and galactose can be fed into glycolysis um, and, um, and be used to make ATP. Now sucrose, we know, is also a, dis a disaccharide um, made up of glucose and fructose. So the enzyme required to digest sucrose to, to um, hydrolyze the glycosidic bond between glucose and fructose would be called sucrase. And um, humans make sucrase. Um, the bacteria that live in our mouth, oh, they love sucrose. And as you can guess, they make sucrase, right? And this is actually kind of important because I remember growing up, my mom would tell me if I ate too much candy, I'd get cavities, dental caries. And it turns out she was right, <laughs> because some of the bacteria that live in our mouth, if we're eating diets high in sugars, the bacteria make the sucrase, they break down the sucrose, and then they can use the sucrose in the process of forming a thick, sticky slime layer on the outside of their cells, and that slime layer lets them stick to our teeth. They want to they stay in our mouth where all that good sugar is going to be. <clears throat> so... They, um, they grow on the teeth, they make more slime layer, other bacteria stick the, to the slime layer, forming this beautiful biofilm, which is not so good for us. 
Um, and another term for that biofilm eventually becomes plaque. And we know plaque is not good for us. Those bacteria stuck to our teeth, um, many of them are what we call lactic acid bacteria. They take the sugars, um, they ferment them to lactic acid, which causes our teeth to decalcify. It increases our risk for dental caries or cavities. And furthermore, if that plaque is not removed, the bacteria living in the plaque um, cause chronic inflammation of our gums. And this is really bad news because it can lead to periodontal disease, which can be really serious. Um, in addition, those bacteria living in the biofilms, living in the plaque in our mouth, whenever we eat or brush our teeth, we have little, a little bit of damage to the mucous membranes in our mouth, and those bacteria can enter the blood the bloodstream and be spread everywhere. Um, this is really important if, if a patient, say, has um, artificial heart valves or maybe has some kind of heart disease, maybe it's had a heart attack, those bacteria potentially could colonize the damaged heart tissues or colonize the artificial heart valves. It's possible they could spread and colonize other damaged surfaces in the body or artificial devices in the body. And indeed, there's been studies that suggest that poor oral health may increase the risk for cardiovascular disease later in life. So those of you going into the dental field, um, that is such an important field for whole body health. When you're taking care of the um, when you're taking care of the oral health of your patient, you really are increasing overall body health. So, um, you know, dental hygiene is just so important. So the third group of carbohydrates are the polymers. Um, so these are called polysaccharides. Um, in some textbooks, you'll see a discussion of oligosaccharides. I never use the term oligosaccharides. These are um, carbohydrates made from 2 to 20 monosaccharides. We will use the term polysaccharide. So again, poly means many sugars. And so polysaccharides consist of tens or hundreds of monosaccharides joined together through dehydration synthesis. And again, we want to remember those new covalent band bonds are called glycosidic bonds. So a couple that we'll be talking about, we'll be talking about starch, which is actually a combination of amylose and amylopectin. We think of, excuse me, not pectin. We think of plants making starch as a storage form of glucose. Glycogen is often referred to as animal starch. <clears throat> Glycogen is a storage form of glucose that, for example, animals make. Um, we're going to be talking about cellulose, which is a, another polymer of glucose that plants make to strengthen their cell walls, so to, so to provide strength. And again, we'll be looking at, we'll look at, we'll look at starch, glycogen, and cellulose and see how the um, use of alpha or beta glucose really influences the, the structure of the polysaccharide and thus the function. <clears throat> so we'll start first with cellulose. This is um, found in plant cell walls, for example and it is a polymer of the beta glucose subunit and this is really has a really cool impact on structure so here we see um, one um, one of our cellulose chains up here and um, one thing that's interesting is that when the glucose subunits are joined together every other glucose glucose subunit is flipped 180 degrees and the glycosidic bond that that's formed here. This is considered a beta 1,4 glycosidic bond between um, carbon 1 and carbon 4, carbon 1 on one glucose and carbon 4 on the other. And because the glucose is in a uh, beta configuration and with this alter, alter um, nation of every other glucose unit being flipped 180 degrees, these chains of cellulose are, are really pretty straight, nice and straight as we can see here. And the reason that's important is it means that these straight chains of cellulose, these linear chains, can pack tightly together and form hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of hydrogen bonds. So here's that little tiny hydrogen bond formed between a hydroxyl group of a, a glucose on one chain and the hydroxyl group of a glucose on another chain here. And we can see here those little dot, dot, dots. Those are all the hydrogen bonds um, binding these linear chains of cellulose together. 
and that provides a lot of strength. And then furthermore, we can have another layer of, um, of cellulose that will, will be um, synthesized in another direction. So we have these layers of cellulose fibers um, in many different directions, and they're all being bound together by these billions of hydrogen bonds. And that's what provides strength for cellulose. And that's really important because cellulose is really important in providing strength to plant cell walls. If, if you, I, like I like to think of the redwood trees, how in the world, you know, can the redwood tree grow so, so tall? Well, one part, one, one part of, of that is gonna be the cellulose in the plant cell walls. But what's, a, what's really cool is that most organisms, including us mammals, us animals, we don't have digestive enzymes to hydrolyze these beta, what we'll call beta glycosidic linkages. So we cannot digest cellulose. We can't use cellulose as a source of um, glucose. Instead, we often refer to it as part of plant fiber. It goes through the intestinal tract, mostly not being digested. And we think that, pl that plant fiber, that roughage is really, really good. It's really healthy. It kind of acts as a mechanical scrubber, kind of keeps us quote unquote regular, you know, making sure we're defecating hopefully every day. And, and there's also some interest in that there are bacteria that do make the enzyme cellulase. And um, one thought might be, well, if you're eating a diet high in plants, high in cellulose, maybe that's helping to encourage some of those good guys, the good beneficial microbes growing in our intestinal tract. <clears throat> So again, the enzyme required to break those beta glycosidic bonds is cellulose, and um, animals don't make it. M most microbes don't. There are some microbes that make cellulase, and they are of great interest because they then can break down the cellulose, releasing the glucose that can be used for other purposes. For example, maybe for making um, biofuels, like alcohol-based fuels. So there is a lot of interest in those cellulase-producing microbes. Now we'll go down here and we'll look at two polymers of alpha-glucose, the other configuration. And these are starch and glycogen. So starch we think of as being a storage form of glucose found in plants. Glycogen is a storage form of glucose found in animals, so we make glycogen. And what's really interesting here is when we make a, a polysaccharide using the alpha glucose subunits, the bond angles here, these alpha glycosidic bonds, it creates this beautiful helical polysaccharide, which is really cool. And furthermore, we can have branch points. We can have branches of helical polysaccharide coming off these little guys here. And so, we're, you know, it's like, well, so what? Well, one thing that's really cool about starch and glycogen is that animals and most, or I shouldn't say most, but a lot of microbes, you know, and animals such as ourselves, we make the hydrolytic enzyme that can break these alpha glycosidic bonds. So that means that humans can use um, starch as a source of glucose for carbon and energy. And if we're eating other animals, we can use their glycogen in their tissues as a source of carbon and energy for our cells. So again, folks, remember that um, humans have the enzymes to break the alpha glycosidic bonds of starch and glycogen, but humans lack the cellulase required to break the beta glycosidic bond found in cellulose. So again, we're you know always interested in how these polysaccharides may or may not be used as a source of um, carbon and energy. So again, just we're kind of repeating ourselves here, but most animals have enzymes to hydrolyze starch and glycogen, that alpha glycosidic bonds. But very importantly, mammals such as humans lack the enzyme cell cellulase. We can't hydrolyze the beta glycosidic bonds of cellulose. So again, we call that the indigestible fiber. However, we do know there's lots of animals and animals called ruminants. And ru Ruminants, they have a really cool, we could say kind of a four compartment stomach. And one of those compartments, the rumen, is this huge microbial fermentation vat. All kinds of microbes in there. Um, we'll have bacteria, and we'll have protozoa, and we probably have 
probably some yeast in there as well. And so ruminants include cows, sheep, deer, and elephants, and more. And what's really cool is that when these ruminants are eating lots and lots of plants, they are herbivores. That's all they do is eat plants. When the plant material with the cellulose enters the rumen, the microbes that live in the rumen that can make cellulase break down the cellulose into glucose. And then the microbes can use the glucose, and then the, the uh, ruminant, the mammal, can use the glucose. So this is an example of mutualism where two different organisms live together, and both of them win. The microbes win because the ruminants are out there harvesting plants and then the ruminants benefit because the microbes in the rumen are breaking down the cellulose so that they can use some of that, some of those um, glucose residues as a source of carbon and energy. So that's really cool. And then um, in animals that aren't ruminants, it's believed that some of the microbes in our large intestine, perhaps some of the microbes in our large intestine can ferment that dietary fiber. Maybe there's some guys in our large intestine that are able to break down a little bit of that cellulose. So I think this will be maybe the almost last slide here. Um, I just want to finish with a short discussion on what we'll call modified carbohydrates. And the two big ones that you're going to hear a lot about in the next unit on cells are NAG, and NAG stands for N-acetylglucosamine, so we, short, we abbreviate it as NAG. And then the other one that's really cool is called N-acetylgramic acid, or NAM. So if we say, why do we call them modified? Well, let's start out with glucose here. And if we take a look at, let's see, this would be carbon-1, carbon-2. Okay, so let's take a look at what's attached to carbon-2. So in N-acetylglucosamine right here, you can see that we've, we've um, added different um, elements that are linked to that carbon, too. So we have like a little amino residue here. That NH is a little amino residue. We have a carbonyl group here, and then uh, carbon and hydrogen at the end. So this is our N-acetylglucosamine. Okay. And where do we find it in nature? Well, some organisms, for example, fungi, so that would be yeast, small, fleshy fungi like mushrooms. And then some animals we call arthropods, jointed legs. Um, these organisms can make chains of N-acetylglucosamine, and that's called chitin. And it's really neat because the um, chitin has those beta-glycosidic bonds in it, so it forms these nice, long, straight chains that can pack tightly together. And does that remind you of cellulose? Yeah, it does. The structure reminds us of cellulose. And so we would guess the, the, the function of chitin might be similar to cellulose to provide strength. And that's exactly what it does. So chitin provides strength in the cell walls of fungi. And we'll be talking about fungi more in um, lecture. And we'll also be talking a little bit more about them um, in Unit 3 on cells. And then another place chitin is used is in the exoskeleton exoskeletons of arthropods. So arthropods are animals that are, have jointed legs and exterior skeletons. So for example, um, lobsters are arthropods and insects are arthropods and spiders and ticks are arthropods. So with arthropods, they don't have an internal skeleton like we do. They have their skeleton on the outside, this hard, protective, strong shell. And so one of the components in the exoskeleton of arthropods is chitin, this um, polysaccharide made of NAG. And again, it provides strength. Now, another modified glucose we're going to talk a lot about, okay, if we take our NAG down here, okay, and now let's focus on what's attached to carbon-3 right here, okay. If we change what we attach to carbon-3, and let's come over here to see, wow, that's, that's a... That's a huge new group, chemical group that's attached here. Now we have NAM, n acetylmeramic acid. And we want to stress that only members of domain bacteria can make NAM. Nobody else can make NAM. If we had, say, um, we sent a probe to Mars, for example, and the probe brought back 
Martian soil samples and we analyzed it and we found evidence chemical signatures of NAM, we would be so excited because for us earthlings, the only organisms that can make NAM in the universe, as far as we know, are bacteria. So we, we would be really excited that if Martian soil had evidence of NAM being present, that would suggest to us that there's Martian bacteria present, and that would be really exciting. So folks, just an aside, a little apology here. Um, this PowerPoint was made when we were using a previous tech, textbook, the Tortora textbook, so I apologize. I didn't get in here and clean up these figure and page numbers, so in general, try to ignore them um, when, you, when you see them later. Okay, so let's just take a peek here. I think maybe there's just one or two more slides uh, relating to carbohydrates, and then we'll close this PowerPoint, and we'll do one last one for lipids. So here's our chitin, our polymer of NAG found in the cell walls of fungi and in the exoskeletons of arthropods. And again, you can see here that um, we're getting just as we saw in cellulose, these are beta-glycosidic linkages. Every other glucose unit is flipped 180 degrees. And again, we don't have the enzymes to hydrolyze those beta-glycosidic bonds. And so what we'll do now, folks, is we'll stop here. So this will be the end of um, Unit 2, Chemistry Part 4, I think we were on, Carbohydrates. And we'll do one last Chemistry PowerPoint movie, and that will be on lipids.